Hello there. My name is Dr. Rob Lau. I'm a consultant haematologist and lymphoma specialist from University Hospital Southampton. And today I'm going to give an overview of lymphoma. I'm going to talk about blood and the immune system. And I'm going to talk about how cancer and specifically lymphoma develops. I'm going to talk about how lymphoma presents and how it's diagnosed. And I'm going to give a brief description on how we approach the treatment of lymphoma. Now, when you're given a diagnosis of lymphoma, obviously it's a big shock. And after your clinic appointment, it's very tempting to go online and have a look at some of the resources available. And actually, nowadays, there are many good resources available on the Internet. And these can be used in conjunction with your discussion with your consultant. And just typing lymphoma into Google can bring up several reputable websites, but many of these are based outside of the UK. So I'd always recommend you go to the Lymphoma Action website, which has got many excellent resources to support you during your diagnosis and your treatment for lymphoma. Now, one of the limitations of looking up lymphoma on the internet is lymphoma is not just one disease. There are very many different types of lymphoma. And when you look it up on the internet, there are so many words associated related to the many different types of lymphoma, which type of lymphocyte lymphoma comes from, and whereabouts in the development of the lymphocyte particular types of lymphoma come from. And so I want to try and give a bit of context to explain where particular lymphomas arise and how they arise. So let's make some sense of all of this. And a really good place to start is just talking about normal blood. And first I'm gonna talk about how blood and the immune system develop. Now blood cells actually all develop in the bone marrow in adults. And within our bone marrow, we have specialized blood cells called stem cells. And these stem cells reside in the bone marrow and they're able to develop into all of the cells that make up our blood and immune system. And these can include white blood cells, such as lymphocytes and neutrophils, red blood cells, which are the specialized oxygen carrying cells, and platelets, which are specialized cells that allow our blood to clot after injury. Now this talk is about lymphoma, so we need to focus on the lymphocytes. And within the bone marrow, our stem cells produce parent or precursor lymphocytes. And these precursor lymphocytes are able to develop into the two main types of lymphocytes. These are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Now our lymphocytes reside within the lymphatic system. Now many people may be familiar with the circulation in the body, our arteries and our veins but actually we have another type of circulation called the lymphatic circulation. And the lymphatic system involves many of these lymphatic channels that drain fluid from the body's tissues and organs. And scattered through these channels are specialized organs called lymph nodes here highlighted by these green dots. These lymph nodes are concentrated in the neck, in the armpits, in the chest, deep in the abdomen, and also in the groin, as well as the elbows and inside the knees. And the distribution of these lymph nodes very much reflects where we can find lymphoma in the body. As well as lymph channels and lymph nodes, our body also contains other specialized lymphoid organs including the thymus, which is really important for the development of T lymphocytes, and also the spleen, which can be affected by many different types of lymphoma. Now, this is a diagram of a lymph node, and lymph nodes are highly specialized organs, which, amongst other things, are important in the management of infection. And when we get infection in our body, the infectious particles such as bacteria or viruses 
can be taken into the lymph node through the lymph channels or through the blood vessels, where they can be detected in specialized areas of the lymph node called the follicles. So the role of the lymph node is to both detect infection and fight it off. But also it has a very important role in remembering infection. So should we get the same infection in months or years down the line, the immune system is better at clearing that infection before indeed it makes us unwell. So lymphocytes need to learn to fight infection. They don't come out of the bone marrow automatically being able to fight off all infections. They have to be trained. Similar to the way we have to educate our children to be the specialists of the future, the lawyers, the doctors, the astronauts, the accountants, our lymphocytes have to be educated through a schooling system which can train them to fight off infection. And this happens within the lymph node itself, particularly for B lymphocytes. So let's take this batch of these immature lymphocytes. These are naive lymphocytes. They're naive because they haven't encountered infection before and they have to be trained. And here we have the follicle of the lymph node. This is this area here. And within the follicle is this central area called the germinal center surrounded by a mantle zone. And that name mantle is important when we think of a particular type of lymphoma. So those immature lymphocytes enter into the lymph node and into the follicle of the lymph node. And in the lymph node, they undergo a process of development, of mutation, something called somatic hypermutation, if you like the terminology. When lymphocytes undergo this process, they can become much more specialized at fighting infection. And lymphocytes which are successful at doing this are able to then leave that lymph node and become specialized lymphocytes. Those that fail to become specialized die off. And those successful cells in particular can become memory cells, which will remember the infection for the future, or they can become antibody producing cells or plasma cells that produce protein that circulates in our bloodstream and which can attack infection before it makes people unwell. And this is the normal development process of the B lymphocyte. And as you'll see later in this talk, particular lymphomas can arise at different stages of this process. So let's talk now in general terms about how cells can become cancerous. Importantly, we need to see what happens normally and what normally causes cells to divide and grow. So within our bloodstream, we usually have X number of white blood cells, neutrophils and lymphocytes. But when we get an infection, our body produces a signal that causes cell growth, a cell growth signal. And that's represented by these green pluses on this slide. This causes the white blood cells to divide and grow so they can better off fight the infection. And what's happening in the body at this time is our white blood cell count in our blood tests rises and the lymph nodes can grow. And that's a normal side effect of infection. And when the infection is getting better, we go through a recovery phase. And this is where we need a controlled cell death because we don't need those white blood cells anymore. The body needs to go back to where it was at the beginning. So those redundant cells, those cells that aren't needed, have a negative signal, a cell death signal, and they disappear and we're back to where we were beforehand. And that's what normally happens in response to infection. Now, cancer cells develop because their DNA undergoes a genetic change or mutation. Now, this can happen just by chance, or it can happen because of environmental insults, just smoking, which can increase the risk of genetic damage. I'm often asked in clinic, why did this happen to me? And sometimes the answer is just bad luck. And why is it bad luck? Well, the reality is our bodies are making cancerous cells 
all the time. If you looked in detail at all of my cells, you would find many cells that had the potential to become cancerous. But in the vast majority of cases, these cells don't become cancerous because we know cancer cells require a signal to grow and they need to not have a signal to tell them to die, just like we saw has happened in a normal response to infection. And almost always when cancer cells develop, the cell doesn't get enough growth signal, but it does get a death signal because our cells have evolved to die off if they become dangerous. But also our immune system is highly trained and it can kill off cancerous cells. So these cells either die by themselves because they're not getting the right signals or the immune system, particularly our T cells, can go in and kill off the cancerous cell. So how does cancer develop? Well, it's that bad luck in some cases or because of repeated insults, for example, from smoking, although that's not the case in lymphoma, that causes cancer cells not to die off and to start to divide. And with time, a dividing cancer cell can become a mass of cancer cells or a tumor. And this is because the cancer cells are making or getting too much growth signal they're blocking the dying signal, the death signal, and they're able to evade the immune system, for example, by putting flags up on their surface, which stop the T cells from coming in and killing them off. So cancer cells can develop several ways to survive and sometimes can become very expert in doing that. And this is a challenge for us as cancer doctors to find ways to get around these mechanisms. So with that in mind, we can look at this diagram and I can explain where certain type of blood cancers arise in this stage of cell development. For example, from stem cells, we have acute leukemia and a rare leukemia called chronic myeloid leukemia. From our white blood cells, lymphoma, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then from our red cells and platelets, two related conditions called polycythemia and essential thrombocythemia. And of course, we're going to concentrate on lymphoma. So what are the different types of lymphoma? Now, when you look this up, the most common classification we see is between Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And now Hodgkin lymphoma was described by a physician from Guy's Hospital in London, Thomas Hodgkin, some 200 years ago, even before microscopes were invented, in a way that allowed people to look at this disease under a high power and be able to look at the detail of it. But we know now that Hodgkin lymphoma looks very different from other types of lymphoma down the microscope. And it's more likely to affect younger people than other types of lymphoma. And every other lymphoma is grouped under this non-Hodgkin lymphoma group. But of course, there's much more detail to it than that. I often use this to teach my medical students, but also when I have patients who have a new diagnosis of lymphoma in clinic. And I will divide lymphomas into two main groups. They're the fast growing lymphomas, also known as high grade or aggressive lymphomas. And these lymphomas often will make people symptomatic quickly. Lymph nodes can grow in a period of weeks or sometimes even days. And often high-grade, fast-growing lymphomas need treatment quickly. The slow-growing lymphomas are often known as low-grade or indolent lymphomas. These may not cause symptoms, and they may have been present for many years before diagnosis, and they don't always require treatment straight away. And then within both these groups, we have B-cell and T-cell types of these lymphomas. And this gives us a really nice framework then in which we can put the main types of lymphoma. So if we first look at fast growing B cell lymphomas, we have diffuse large B cell lymphoma, by far the most common type of this fast growing B cell lymphoma, but also rarer lymphomas such as Burkitt lymphoma and some mantle cell lymphoma. Fast-growing T-cell lymphomas include anaplastic large-cell lymphoma and peripheral T-cell lymphoma. And then we have slow-growing B-cell lymphomas, including the most common, which is follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, and mantle cell lymphoma. 
And then finally, we have this rare group of slow-growing T-cell lymphomas. Most commonly, these are the skin or cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. So where in that cell cycle, cell development, do different types of lymphoma come from? I said I'd talk through this. So let's go back to our lymph node. And we've talked already about the follicle, which is where the action really happens in terms of B lymphocyte development. And within these follicles, we have this central area, the germinal center, and then around it, the mantle zone. And we've talked through how B cells go into the germinal center, mutate, and can become memory cells or antibody cells. So where in this process do these different types of lymphoma arise from? Well, firstly, if we look at our immature, our naive B lymphocytes, we see some patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a very similar condition is called small lymphocytic lymphoma. They are very similar and they are, can arise, not in all cases, but they can arise from these immature B cells. From our germinal center, we see the common lymphomas arise. So follicular lymphoma rises within the follicle, hence the name, and diffuse large B cell lymphoma, certain types arise within this germinal center. And also Burkitt lymphoma, and we think Hodgkin lymphoma, though it's a bit less clear with Hodgkin's. From the mantle zone, of course, we have mantle cell lymphoma arising as these lymphocytes exit the germinal center through the mantle before leaving the lymph node. From these antibody cells or plasma cells, we have conditions such as Waldenstrom's or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and also a related blood cancer called myeloma. And then finally, from these memory cells, we can see another type of chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. And there are many other different types of lymphoma, which I haven't included here, but these are the more common ones. So how do we diagnose and stage lymphoma? Now, many people who come to see the doctor will have a lump, and it will be in the areas that are usually quite easy to feel. You remember that picture of the lymph node groups, when we described this concentration of lymph nodes in the neck, in the armpit, as you can see in this picture, and in the groin. These are the areas that we can readily feel because they're just underneath the skin. However, there are other areas where lymph nodes are more common, such as the tummy and in the chest. So we do not uncommonly see people coming to clinic without any lymph nodes that we can feel, but when they have a scan, we can see a lump in the chest, or we can see a lump in the tummy. Sometimes we see lymphoma develop in some of the lymphoid organs, particularly the spleen, and in the thymus as well. But of course, lymphocytes are also in the blood, and blood is everywhere. So we can see lymph lymphoma develop in the brain, in the eyes, in the gut, in the skin, literally anywhere. It is one of those conditions that can arise anywhere in the body, but most commonly in these areas of the lymphatic system. Now, lymphoma is commonly associated with what are known as B symptoms. And there are three specific symptoms that are more a feature of aggressive or fast growing lymphomas, perhaps, than the slow growing lymphomas. And these include weight loss, night sweats, which typically are drenching, so the sheets are soaked, and people will often have to change their pajamas, change their sheets, or sleep on a towel. And also fevers, which are unexplained, i.e., they're not caused by an infection. But because lymphoma can be anywhere in the body, it can affect any of the body's organs. There are many other potential symptoms of lymphoma. And again, I'd like to point you towards the Lymphoma Action website for more information on that. Now, some tests are more common in patients with lymphoma. So when you see the doctor and after your clinic appointments, you may have blood tests. You may have scans, including an ultrasound, a CT scan or a PET scan. And many people will require a biopsy. And again, there are many different ways of doing biopsies. It can be done with a very fine needle, although that is not always accurate. It can be done with a bigger needle called a core biopsy. It can be done using surgery, generally under anesthetic, where a whole lymph node or part of a lymph node can be removed. Or also we can do it 
in a bone marrow biopsy. Once lymphoma has been diagnosed, then we stage the lymphoma. And staging is a way of describing how widespread the lymphoma is. And we use a staging system called the Ann Arbor staging system, and it's split into four stages. Stage one involves just one or one group of lymph nodes. Stage two involves two groups of lymph nodes, but they have to be on the same side of the diaphragm. And you can see the diaphragm here, which basically splits the body into two. So for example, in this picture, there's lymph nodes in the neck and the armpit, but there's nothing below the diaphragm. So this is stage two. This could also be a patient with lymph nodes in the groin and the tummy, but nothing above the diaphragm. And that would also be stage two. And together, stage one and two are sometimes referred to as early stage or localized. Stage three lymphoma involves two or more groups of lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm. For example, it could be in the neck and the groin, or it could be in multiple sites on both sides of the diaphragm, but it has to involve lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm. And stage four typically involves lymph nodes, though not always, but it also involves the body's organs with two or more areas of involvement of the body's organs, for example, the liver, the lungs, or the bone marrow. And together, stage three and four are often referred to as advanced. So finally, I just want to briefly talk about how we treat lymphoma. And I'm going to use some of the examples I've given earlier in this talk to illustrate how scientists have been able to develop treatments that target each stage of the cell development. So here's our tumor cell, which we know can divide and become a lump of tumor cells or a tumor. And the first type of treatment, which many people will be familiar with or would have heard of, is chemotherapy. Now, chemotherapy is able to damage DNA or damage the mechanisms that allow cells to grow and divide. So if we give chemotherapy to a cell, when it tries to divide, it dies off. And this is the main mechanism for chemotherapy drugs. Another group of drugs we use are antibodies. Now we've talked about antibodies already. Our body, our plasma cells produce normal antibodies to fight off infection. And scientists have been able to re-engineer antibodies, not to target infection, but to target proteins or markers on the surface of cancer cells. And when they bind to these markers, they're able to either kill off the cell directly or encourage other cells of the immune system to come in and kill off the cell. We also talked about cancer cells requiring this growth signal in order to grow and divide and develop. And scientists have also developed drugs that can target this growth signal, block this growth signal. And one class of drugs includes Ibrutinib, which is used for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, mantle cell lymphoma, and drugs of its class are used in other types of lymphoma as well and can be very effective at stopping these cells from growing. And of course, cancer cells can be very good at turning off that death signal. They can block that death signal so they don't die off. And we now have drugs that can unblock that death signal. For example, venetoclax, again used in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is extraordinarily effective at getting this rare leukemia under control. And finally, we have immune therapies or cell therapies. And these are drugs that can improve the way the immune system works in order to get a better response against that cancer. And one example of this is CAR T cells. These are genetically engineered T lymphocytes that can target and directly kill off cancer cells and these can be very effective therapies in some people in whom other treatments have not worked. So the other type of treatment that is commonly used for lymphoma is radiotherapy. A radiotherapy essentially is very powerful x-rays that are able to directly damage and kill cells. Radiotherapy is very good for patients whose lymphoma is just in one area or for lymphoma 
that may be causing particularly bad symptoms. Now, of course, we don't use all these treatments at once. And in some patients, the lymphoma will come back after the initial treatment. And having such a diverse range of treatments allows us to offer patients several lines of treatment, even if the lymphoma relapses several times. The other thing about lymphoma, in fact, is that it doesn't always need treatment straight away. And some people, for example, those with low-grade lymphoma, those without symptoms, those with normal blood counts, those with no evidence of damage or imminent damage to the body's organs, and those without particularly large lymph nodes may not need treatment at all for some time. And in fact, this period of time can be quite long. And in some patients, although it's unusual, the lymphoma doesn't necessarily grow at all and can even regress. And so these patients are often offered what's called active monitoring, or we used to call it watch and wait, where you're seen by your lymphoma doctor in clinic. You may have some blood tests done. And after a period of years, you may not even need to be seen in clinic regularly, but you can get in touch with the team should you have worrying symptoms. And we know that active monitoring does not increase the risk of coming to harm from your lymphoma in the longer term, neither does it reduce the effectiveness of treatment that you may eventually be offered. So to summarize, blood and immune cells are made in the bone marrow. Lymphoma develops from specialized immune cells called lymphocytes. Lymphocytes learn to fight infection within the lymphatic system. And different lymphomas arise at different stages of lymphocyte development. And lymphoma treatment has developed from research into how normal lymphocytes function. So I hope you found this talk helpful. Thank you very much.